databases. Love them, hate them, you probably still need them. SQL, NoSQL, GraphQL SQL, whatever you're using, it's not easy to work with. And the few things that are easy to work with, like Prisma, come with their own gotchas. It feels like when new tools are introduced that improve the developer experience with databases, they often come at performance cost. I would love to see a future where we don't take a performance hit just to have a better developer experience. And I think I found some tools that get us pretty close. Prisma's an incredible developer experience. The concept of writing a single schema in a single file that compiles out to SQL on one side and TypeScript on the other, allowing us to write SQL as auto-completing TypeScript and have type-safe responses and everything we would expect as full-stack TypeScript developers right there. However, Prisma comes with some baggage. Originally, Prisma was a GraphQL SQL translator type thing that would automatically generate a GraphQL API based on your SQL database, kind of like Hasara. Thankfully, they realized the error in their ways, and most of the original Prisma team is very anti-GraphQL code gen tools. Generally, they wanted to make it easier to work with SQL in your TypeScript. I think they did it. The Prisma syntax for schemas is very nice to work with. The Prisma developer experience to do migrations, deploy changes, work with your team, Overall, really, really good, but it comes with costs, specifically all the tech debt from V1. Prisma has a gigantic GraphQL binding within it still. That is the translator between the SQL native connection layer in Rust and the TypeScript layer that actually runs and connects in Node land. The performance is not the best, especially once you get into serverless land where you have to ship this giant Rust binary. You have to spin it up, you have to connect it to TypeScript, and you have to form a connection to the SQL database. And then finally, you can start making queries. Doing all of those things every time any request is made is really, really rough. And the performance shows. A cold start from a brand new Next.js Lambda is <sighs> rarely more than half a second. I'll usually see two to 300 milliseconds where I am, which is San Francisco. A cold start where you're getting some data with Prisma even on a fast database that's co-located, can get as high as three seconds. That's 3,000 milliseconds, way more than a 10x time difference. And that's just assuming you're on Lambda. Once you get off of Lambda and start moving to the edge, Prisma can't run at all because Prisma relies on so much native Rust code and JavaScript binaries that run only in Node. And that dependence on both Node and Rust native code that's hundreds of megabytes makes it basically impossible to run Prisma on the edge without some crazy hacks and proxying and things that aren't in a great place yet. Thankfully, an unexpected challenger has appeared and made something that makes a lot of this way smoother. I want to be very clear here. The DX that Prisma provides does not exist in the stuff that we're about to talk about, but I'm hoping we can change that in the near future because the goal of database JS was not the best possible developer experience. It was provide the primitives for the best possible performance in serverless and edge runtimes. Okay, when I filmed this, I hadn't heard about Drizzle before. Please forgive me. I'll be talking all about Drizzle soon. I'm about to do a stream on it. We'll have some videos coming soon. Drizzle ORM is dope. The rest of the video is still relevant, even if I don't mention Drizzle. Trust me, it's useful. More content coming soon. Database JS by Planet Scale is one of the most promising technologies I have seen in the database space. Let's talk about it. Database JS is two things PlanetScale introduced. One is a library you npm install, and the other is an HTT-based SQL endpoint on the PlanetScale service so you can query and mutate data from your database without actually having to connect via SQL. This is a huge win for developers who are building full stack TypeScript stuff that don't want to eat the three second cold starts from something like Prisma because there's no connection being made, which means we don't need the native code that forms the connection. We don't need a native runtime like Lambda to actually spin up native binaries to make the connection. We don't even need those native binaries. This means that the size of my app deployed to get all the code to a user can go down from literally three to 400 megabytes down to like a meg, which is fully able to be run on the edge. This library is one of the most important pieces enabling me to start deploying applications on the edge. We're working on a project for a bit now, video coming soon. I wanted to finally cave into a full stack create T3 app tutorial. And what I found was as great as the developer experience was, the performance wasn't great. So we're going to open a new tab and we're going to time the performance of this site, emojer.vercel. This is Twitter, but only emojis. More coming on this soon.
Still waiting. Still waiting. How long did that take? Finished 11.29 seconds. Are you fucking kidding? Are you kidding? I think we got hit by multiple cold starts there. But now we have a really good number to use for me to do the like, I made my databases like 1,400 whatever X percent faster. I don't have auth working on the reference that I'm about to show. I want to be clear about that because the clerk edge runtime specifically for auth on edge is it has a bug with buffer being included right now. They're working on fixing it, it should be fixed by like tomorrow. Oh, on the clerk stuff, they fixed it an hour after I recorded. Uh, yeah, the clerk guys work fast. Can't recommend them highly enough. As far as I know, they're the only fully edge ready auth solution that works with all the fancy new Next.js stuff too. So check them out. But there is like one piece of functionality not there. And I wanted to be fair about that when I do this comparison. I have this one hard coded to use my name because again, the, the auth layer isn't working. But let's, did you see how much faster that was? Is that 170 milliseconds? Command shift R is 188 milliseconds. Like, are you fucking kidding? It's insane. It's actually insane. Yeah, this is edge based, which is a huge part of the difference to be clear, like a significant part. We can go to a quick benchmark planet scale bench. Yeah, so like, and this is fetching a shitload of data. This is fetching 2700 rows and it's doing it in 130 milliseconds from request to like response. Like full request to render time is under 500 milliseconds for a page that is interfacing with over 2,500 rows. It's so much faster. We're, we're not talking a 10x difference. We're talking a 100x difference here. And the ability to get your data on the edge without huge performance penalties is insane. I am genuinely really impressed with what I'm seeing here. Somebody mentioned here that Edge makes even more of a difference when you're not in SF. It's actually a very important thing you brought up because I used to think this. And when we're talking about databases in particular, it's not that simple. You request data from the server. The server requests data from the database based on who you are and what to get. The database sends the data back to the server, which then sends that data to you. If you go far away, yeah, that kind of sucks that it takes so long to get the first response to you, especially if the server like sends you something and then gets more data and sends you more after if you're like doing streaming or something, not the best. What if we move the server here? Cool, now we can get a response to the user way faster, which seems great, right? But what if we didn't just need to make one request? What if this first database request comes back with auth? So the first request is, is this user authed? And it comes back and says, yes, this user's auth. At which point you say, okay, cool, the user's auth. I need to get more data. And then you get that more data and then you send it. The thing that's interesting here is the total distance traveled if the server is too far away from the database is actually much higher if you move the server close to the user and there's more than one request being made. It's very easy to run into this problem if you do SQL, do something else, and then do more SQL within a request, which is almost always going to end up happening realistically. Ideally, every request would make one query, but they're not going to. They're going to make multiple, and they're not going to do them as single transactions. Because of that, it actually often makes sense to put the server as close to the database as possible and then deal with the distance of travel from the server to the user. And as great as Edge is, and Edge is great, it is great at getting bytes to the user as fast as possible. It is not great at synchronizing the bytes correctly between the database and the user. Most companies are starting to recommend regional Edge, which is what Vercel is doing, where you run Edge functions in a specific region. So you still get the performance wins from Edge cold starts as well as the cost difference where Edge is just hilariously cheap compared to Lambda, but you don't get the edge function being run really close to the user. It's run as close as possible to the database so that you don't have to take a bigger penalty here. This is probably the right decision to be determined. We're still figuring all of this out in database edge render SSR cache land. Like where do we cache things? Where do we fetch things? Where do we put things? Where do we turn them from? How do we invalidate caches? All of these are still kind of open questions, but in the time being, your edge function should be way closer to your server if at all possible. So yeah, I am blown away with the performance that I've been seeing where yes, like the total distance traveled is probably pretty similar, 
However, the amount of time it takes for the server to start up is way, way faster. Do you know what would actually be helpful if I do like a step-by-step -step how a request is made? So this is the order of events if you're using like Vercel, Lambda, serverless, traditional, like what Create T3 app uses, what, what you have to use if you're using Prisma, the, the standard. So first the request for the page is sent to Vercel. Then Vercel spins up a Lambda with your JS bundle. Lambda runs JS bundle, including Prisma bindings in Rust. Then Prisma bindings form database connection. Database query made. Actually, there's, there's more steps here. The, the rest of the steps are smaller, to be fair, like uh, type script calls GQL Prisma middleware. Prisma SQL connection receives request. Prisma sends request to database. Database responds data. You'll notice this is pretty hilarious amount of steps. Type script receives data. Data sent to next. PRPC, whatever, render or format step. <laughs> this is like if it's Next.js and you're like page rendering, then the render or format steps where like the actual render happens. So you render or format and then send response to user. And this is assuming that you're only making one query. This is all of the things that happen when you make a request as a user. It's a lot, like a lot, a lot. Do you know what else is a lot? The number of people who are watching this video that haven't subscribed to the channel yet. Come on, guys. Subscriptions are free. Hit that button for me. Appreciate it a ton. There are a lot of points in here where things can get really slow. So the first major point of concern is here. The size of this bundle. I don't know how to put this other than like Prisma is expensive. It's a big bundle, like guaranteed over 100 megs. And that's a huge pile of code to have to be shipped to a Lambda every time a request is run and there isn't a warm Lambda already, which more often than not, there won't be. This sucks. This is like a guaranteed penalty of at least a few hundred milliseconds on every single request to your service that isn't cached. So here is like guaranteed 200 MS plus penalty already out the gate. Next, we have Prisma actually forming the database connection. Database connections aren't and cheap. They require a few steps of validation and verification, and it is a back and forth. I can't honestly say how much the penalty here would be. I am not familiar enough with different like connection methods and what to expect there, but 200 milliseconds is, is probably generous for the cost of actually connecting to the database. This whole section here is relatively cheap, but still like takes time and isn't the most pleasant thing. If we go down here to the database responding, I'd say that this part here is the next big penalty, which would be, honestly, I've seen some scary numbers here. I would say at least 400 milliseconds, depending on region. I'll say depends a lot, but exponential with greater than one query, where these can get slow. And then the rest is relatively cheap. What we end up here or with here is a guaranteed 400 millisecond penalty plus just for using Prisma on Lambda. Isn't the legacy GQL middleware like 20% of the issue? It definitely contributes to this being so big, which causes it to be slow. And it also contributes to the slowness between each and every request, but it's not the biggest deal. It's the, the size of the bundle is probably the biggest thing, but the, the underrated piece is requiring a connection to be made. Part of why database JS is so much faster is it doesn't require a connection to be made. So if I was to copy over this guy and we'll redo this, I should do it on the side so we can compare the sizes more easily. I'll put it here for now. I'll do Vercel date or edge p scale database JS. So request sent to Vercel. Vercel doesn't spin up a lambda. Vercel opens reads cached JS from Vercel. Wow, like almost all of these steps are dead. I can like kill almost all of this. So we'll delete all that. Kill this one red box that made it over. Database JS client instantiated. Database JS client passed SQL string. Base JS client fires fetch request with that SQL planet scale HTTP endpoint responds with data. That's like 
a third as many data steps and data related things. Yeah. And all these slow parts are gone. That's the, the real magic here that makes me so excited is the parts here that were scary performance wise are almost entirely eliminated. And given that this will likely have to run on every request, that's super, super valuable. So the result here is that I've seen, as we saw at the beginning of the stream, like total 11.92 seconds. I'll do that as milliseconds since it's easier. And then the total here, we had a few that were under 200 milliseconds. So I'll just say one was like 161 MS. That's a pretty substantial difference. And it's not even like a super uncommon one to see. Like I've seen serverless systems using Prisma and running into numbers as this high pretty consistently. Even if I go to like, so ping is fast, especially like the homepage flies. If we go dashboard, yeah, that was much faster than I expected. Not too bad, all things considered. We talked a bit about the performance wins database JS offers. What about the developer experience? I don't want to write SQL strings and type definitions all the time when I'm accessing my database. Prisma does a great job of giving you a schema that allows you to define your model once and then immediately have both type safe query builders for actually writing the query with autocomplete in TypeScript as well as having type safe responses. So when you make one of those queries, you know exactly what you're going to get. The experience is great and we're not quite there yet in database JS edge land, but we're getting there. And one of the most important pieces to get us there is a library named Keasley. Keasley is a query builder created by, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, Sammy, but Sammy is an incredibly talented developer. who has been working super hard on Keasley for a while now. The goal of Keasley is to make querying your database in TypeScript type safe once you've defined the types. It doesn't define the types for you, but once you've defined them, you get all the fancy autocomplete that we're used to. We could see here await db dot select from has the different things you can select from, has the ability to do a join with other related fields, all as defined in your type definitions. Or select specific fields and which fields you want to join against. I wish I could fast forward the GIF. And here you see they're selecting the specific fields from the things that are joined. So now this is going to select the pet name or the person's first name and then the pet's name as pet name. And now the result's going to be correctly typed where person ID is one. And now person is going to be a properly typed thing. See person dot first name and pet name. So cool. This is dope. It's not quite as convenient as Prisma. I do like the syntax of Prisma a tiny bit more. This is much more traditional sequely, but the result is fully type safe SQL if you write the type defs. But how do I use this with PlanetScale and database.js? Well, there's actually an awesome community member. Huge shout out to Jacob for killing it with this project. I mentioned on stream that I wanted this and it seems like he's actually using it at his company now, which is dope. Huge shout out to Depot, making Docker images way faster and pieces of tech as they do it. Jacob made Keasley PlanetScale, which is a simple binding where you can connect using database.js in Keasley. It's like five lines of code to set it up. And now you're good to go and you can just use Keasley like you would for any other database with all these cool benefits. You still have to write the type definitions, which is annoying, but we've actually seen some cool progress here. Uh, right now, the recommended way to get around this is some work by our good friend Nexel, who uh, back in November actually made a hacked up example. He used Prisma for the schema in the actual type generation and database typings and Prisma migrate for actually updating the database. But from there, he took over with Keasley. He'd generate the types off of Prisma in the database state off of Prisma and then use Keasley to actually make the queries. Super cool to see that he got this all working. It's not the cleanest thing and you still have to do some work to make the types play together nicely, but we're getting there. And I definitely see a potential future where somebody either rips the schema layer from Prisma or builds a new better one just to make a better experience for writing your SQL's structure in one file and getting a good developer experience as well as good performance. All the pieces are here now. All we need is a good schema that can be shared with these tools and we're good to go. So there's an open challenge to anybody watching the stream and anybody watching this video, there's a massive opportunity right now to combine these parts and make a best in class developer and user experience. So if you have some time, you like SQL, and you want to push the boundaries of web technologies, now's a better time than ever to do it. I enjoyed this rant a lot. I hope you guys did too. I have another database video or whatever YouTube seems to think you're going to like here. So click that if you haven't. It's a good one. I promise. If you want more info about picking a better database, I'll pin that one there.
Thank you as always. Peace.